Good afternoon. My name is Vicky Songyeon Kwan. I am Associate Curator of Korean Art and Culture at Rome. I am delighted that you could join us for today's Rome Connect Digital Program. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Rome sits on the ancestral lands of the Wanda, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabeg Nation, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, since time immemorial to today. I would like to acknowledge that Rome Connect is generally supported by the Schmidt family. This program is funded by the Ministry of Culture, Sports, and Tourism of the Republic of Korea. In today's conversation, I'm delighted to welcome literature and Asian diaspora studies scholar Christine Kim and visual artist Diana Yu to discuss the nuances of Korean experiences in Canada. Please welcome my guest. Dr. Christine Kim is Associate Professor of English at the University of British Columbia and editor of the journal Canadian Literature. Her research and teaching focuses on Asian North American literature and theory, diaspora studies, and cultural studies. Diana Yu is a Korean Canadian artist and educator, currently pursuing her PhD at York University, her intersectional identity as a second generation Korean Canadian racialized female artist is foundational to her self-reflexive autobiographical research. By undertaking an artistic project on the representation of trauma in the history of race and colonialism in Canada, used art utilizes the gallery platform to generate ethical political visions of social justice. Today's talk was initiated as a reflectional talk of our exhibition that I and Hong Kal, art historian professor at York University, co-curated at the Korean Cultural Center Canada in Ottawa early this year. This exhibition was inspired by Christine's influential paper, National and Global Decolonial Practices, Asian and Indigenous Interreferencing, published in 2019. The exhibition titled Reimagining Places, Land, Store, Home was based on and the beginning of our research on how recognizing and addressing historical injustice toward indigenous and marginalized communities in Canada has challenged the Canadian national identity and how experiences of Asian migrants and their descendants as visual minorities have further complicated the national identity of Canada. Facing these moments and discourses, the exhibition presented new pro projects by three Korean Canadian artists who delve into their multi-faceted, layered experiences of living on colonized lands as migrants of color through the themes of land, store, and home. We featured works by three artists, Diana Yu's photographic work related to Asian convenience stores in Ontario, Toronto-based Korean-Canadian artist Yoon Jin Jung's multimedia installations that address displacement, and Vancouver-based Korean-Canadian artist Jin Mi Yoon's single-channel video filmed on the charged Australian lands in Canada. Today, we invited Diana Yu and Christine Kim to share their work and thoughts on Korean-Canadian diasporic art and Asian-Canadian literature. Everyone is the audience, you're welcome to join the conversation, but I encourage you to submit your questions and thoughts via the Q&A feature during our conversation with Diana and Christine, and we will do our best to address them during the program. Okay, let me turn to Diana first. Diana, um, Diana and I worked together for two exhibitions together. First was at Arco Art Gallery in Korea in Seoul back in 2016. And the second exhibition was this one at the Korean Culture Center in Ottawa this year. Diana, um, in the two exhibitions, you show some continuities and changes in your topics and artistic approaches for your um, work. Could you give us a brief introduction of your work uh, over the past 10 years? Uh, let's start from your show at John B. Aird Gallery in Toronto. Sure, Vicky. Um, well, I first want to thank everyone for being here. Thank you so much. It's wonderful that we have this platform. 
Um, yeah, the show at the John B. Air Gallery um, and the Arco Gallery was comprised of various artworks about my search for evidence for Korean history that was missing from my life as a Korean Canadian second generation immigrant. Um, so I'm just gonna share some of my work with you. Uh, some of the works um, I will show here, this was called Prisoners Once Here in 2014. It is a still of a time-based video artwork. It was created with footage uh, that was made at Sodeman Prison in Seoul, South Korea. And it was really my search for um, the historical sites that um, really drove my work. Uh, where And at this Sodeman prison, it is where anti-colonial activists were imprisoned beginning in 1908 during Japanese coloniz colonization of Korea until World War II. And the prisoners were held captive by military dictators during the Korean War in 1950 to 1953. In this artwork, I'm really interested in creating a means for empathic witnessing and to mourn for the activist lives in which only products of their forced labor remain, the bricks that were created during their imprisonment. So these bricks were made by the prisoners. And then as a commemoration, they they actually put the laid the bricks down uh, to indicate where the cells used to be. So it is actually a video and I follow the path of bricks demarking where the prisoner cells uh, are located and uh, and then rain begins to fall and droplets accumulate staining the exposed bricks making them look like droplets of um, blood almost. Okay so this work um, is two pictures of documentations of interior ceilings that were left in ruins by bullet holes made during the battle of the Korean War. Uh, and in the Korean War, there was estimated casualties between 2.8 to 3.69 million, which I thought was devastating. And the depicted cells are from the North Korean Labor Party building. It's located just south of the demilitarized zone in South Korea. And the building still stands, but it's in ruins. And I realized in this artwork that um, I was trying to represent the trauma of the war. Um, however, I realized that trauma in itself cannot be represented and it exists in this in the realm of unrepresentability, which is why the title of the works is called Unrepresentability. However, artwork can act as an index or portal to where the trauma emerged. These images were installed higher up on an angle against the gallery walls so that the viewer can experience looking up at the ceilings of the North Korean Labor Party building. And these are just detailed views. In 2016, um, as part of the um, exhibit at the John B. Aird, I installed this work titled Across Boundaries. And I acknowledge the division of the two Koreas in my life. I juxtaposed imagery of a convenience store counter and the DMZ together in an installation and performance piece. In this artwork, I silently tie ribbons behind the image of a chocolate bar counter. And in the background, there's a video of the DMZ. The DMZ represents not only a physical boundary, but also a psychological one that distances us from the reality of approximately 200,000 victims of internment camps and ongoing famine in North Korea. As part of an attempt to memorize the memorialize the loss of this war, I stand behind the convenience store counter writing on memorial ribbons to honor the tragic history of the ongoing 70 year long conflict. Oops. This is just a bigger installation view. And I'm interested in this, I'm conflicted by the state of this division. And I want to consider the alternate possibility of peace for the two Koreas. Yeah, continue. Actually, that's a very important word. That's those series was it at the, um... Arco Art Gallery, I curated in Korea. Yes, these ones were from Arco. And um, it's where Dr. Vicky Kwan curated um, the exhibition Mass and the Individual, the archive of the Guyanese Mass Games. And in my research on Korean diaspora experience, convenience store counters questions how public spaces for capitalist trade, such as the convenience store counter, creates a kind of situational barrier in which distance further manifests. I question how capitalist labor tends to require assimilation to a colonial dominated Canada. 
How does diaspora survival in Canada entail pushing to the margins of one's own difference? How might divided communities disrupt polarizations of otherness to allow more pluralistic communities of belonging? My research practice offers space for omitted stories of oppression to be claimed proposing disruptions in line linear history. This is the uh, gallery view of the show in Arco. Uh, I just have a couple more works that were part of um, the first installation at the John B. Air Gallery. So this work is titled Tourists in the Division. It is a documentary style video that I recorded to indicate how the war is being mediated. The American soldier is giving a tour of the JSA Blue Building in the DMZ. And in this clip, the American soldier confidently asserts their presence in South Korea to defend it from North Koreans. And I wonder why is the DMZ tour given by an American soldier rather than a South Korean soldier? Who is, speaking for the war, who is speaking for the war in Korea, and why is the conflict continuing and ongoing? Okay, and finally, before I go on to the Dream Strong project that Vicky was talking about, um, this is a work called Delineation, and it was taken at the DMZ. The reason why I'm so kind of... Um, preoccupied with the DMZ is because my father lost six brothers and sisters in 1950 at the war. And they were divided and never reunited. And uh, in the 90s, we received a letter from them and they said the youngest and the oldest died from uh, starvation. So they were victims of the famine. And then we never heard back from the rest. So um, our understanding was that they had all passed away due to the famine. So where the division between South and Korea, South and North Korea exists, is the division of the DMZ. And it's a panoramic view. Uh, I took about four pictures and seen them together. When I look at this image, it feels charged with energy, um, kind of hostility. I know that in Korea, civilians find this image quite banal. However, as a second generation Korean Canadian diaspora immigrant, I had no previous idea of what this division looked like until I visited it for myself and saw it with my own eyes. And so there's something revealing about it for me. Uh, now I can talk about, uh, as um, Dr. Kwan was saying, uh, the work uh, in Toronto, you're interested in yeah, the dream this project. project. Uh, this project is called Dream Strong. Uh, on July 21st, 2018, I launched a participatory community project entitled Dream Strong at Jouet Festival uh, called, uh, in the part of the Big Unblur Festival Arts and Culture. This art project was organized in response to the violent attack, um, the Toronto van attack that killed 10 injured 16 innocent pedestrians on April 23rd, 2018. Dream Strong provided a brave space public venue for many participants. There were over 90,000 visitors. And so, so many people saw this uh, installation. They were from different backgrounds and ages. And I wanted them to think at this booth to dream strongly about such a violent public attack, which was rooted against the hatred against women. Participants were invited to collaborate in a dream ribbon project and asked to write down three keywords describing what dreams they have for the future in Toronto. The multicolored ribbons inspire notions of inclusivity, intersecting identities, equity of peoples, and hope towards healing. I invited participants to then connect the ribbons with other colored ribbons so throughout the day the act of connecting them together would eventually result in a site-specific participatory multicolored dream ribbon installation. Through this artwork, I strove to lead by example to encourage sharing in dreams of interconnectedness with the community, designating a safe place for collective thought. Could you, yeah, could you also show us that your COVID project? Of course, yes. Um, during the third wave of the pandemic, I made a, a series of works called COVID Closures, 20, made in 2021. Uh, and there were public playgrounds, tennis courts, basketball courts, and soccer fields that were closed down. The heightened fear of interacting with others due to the coronavirus became a regular feeling. Staying socially distanced from others was the safest thing to do to survive during the pandemic. 
While we were isolated, there was much time to be frightened, not only by the pandemic, but also by our haunted past. The major discovery of three mass graves of Indigenous children for the residential schools uh, became obvious and um, were evidence that Canada's past is haunted by the violent genocide inflicted upon this land. How can we remember the pandemic as a time of not only threatening virus, but also as a time to acknowledge and remember the inhumane colonial and racial violence that has taken place on the Indigenous territories of Canada? We are now haunted by an undoable past. Ever more pressing is the need to remember the times of the pandemic as a time that has shocked us through social trauma that persists to protect, press upon us. How does the unknown futurity and the haunting past leave our society in a state of disarray and fear? Right, that those emptiness and the feeling of isolation in the photos are compelling. Um, and then uh, you came back to, after this project, you came back to the convenience stores of Asian uh, Canadians as your subject matters. Could you touch upon that project? It's also related to your PhD dissertation, isn't it? Indeed. Um, yes. So this project uh, is called Inconveniences. It was part of a, a group exhibition that you curated, um, Land, Store, and Home. Um, and... In this project, I thought it was really important to kind of return to the convenience store as a commercial site where I can intervene. And I wanted to create signs in front of the store as a way to speak out against, you know, in Canada, the Korean store owner is very cliche. There's Kim's convenience mm -hmm. and there's just a kind of a general like glossing over of, um, you know, acceptance of this. But I think finding a voice uh, and having a way to um, index what we're thinking or what I'm thinking outside of the store front is really important. So the commercial space where Korean Canadian immigrants interact with the public is kind of a manual labor that numbs us and makes us complacent in Canadian cult consumer culture. In the capitalist market, the seller and buyer detach from their own histories, where I detach my own history and separate present from past. While the store for me is a public space where Korean Canadian immigrants interact with the public, it is, however, this kind of transactional labor that numbs us and makes us complacent in Canadian consumer culture. In my artwork, I post signs up in front of the commercial sites to speak out and advocate for how we must consider injustices, both colonial and racist in nature and the failures inherent in our capitalist society. This work is also part of my PhD um, dissertation called Spectral Capitalism, where I propose to conduct a critical study of capitalist Canada as it pertains to colonialism and racialized injustices due to global capitalism. Uh, I delve into my own research-driven photographic art practice where I embark to explore my Korean Canadian identity and relationship to capitalist society. I scrutinize how we are profoundly stuck in capitalism and from truly reconciling with the traumatic history of Indigenous communities in Canada. I, yeah, this, um, let's, let's take more time to talk more about your work and then maybe future project. And from here, um, let's turn to Christine. Uh, thank you, Diana. Thank you so much for showing your like various works in this short condensed time. Thank you very much. Christine, um, your article was definitely the inspiration of our exhibition. And this is something that I was like, uh, the topic was I was uh, uh, working on throughout the time I was concluding my own dissertation on socially engaged art, Korea, and thinking about my own position as a Korean Canadian uh, immigrant. I would like to bring up uh, your two articles. I mentioned your um, 2019 article as the inspiration, which was National and Global Decolonial Practices, Asian and Indigenous Interreferencing. And you published another article at the same year, in the same year, which was co authored with Christopher Lee. And the article is titled Interreferencing Asian Canadian Studies, Imagining Diasporic Possibility Outside the Bracket Canadian, close bracket nation, 
Yeah, you must be very busy in 2019 and very productive. And in your second article, you begin by mentioning a noticeable change in Asian Canadian studies. What are they? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Vicky, for uh, that question. Um, before I start, I just wanted to begin by acknowledging, um, because I'm out on the West Coast, um, I wanted to begin by acknowledging that I'm on the unceded traditional Coast Salish lands, which include the Tsleil-Waututh, Coquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. Um, I also wanted to uh, thank you for reading the articles and thinking about them, um, and uh, to you and Aaron for inviting me to be part of this dialogue, and to the ROM for hosting. Um, I'm also uh, grateful to Diana for being on this panel. It was really wonderful to hear about her work and to see those slides. Um, so the uh, the article that you were talking about, the one uh, that I wrote with Chris, uh, where we were thinking about Asian Canadian studies, um, a lot of that sort of came out of uh, this idea of, of we were working in Asian Canadian studies, we've been sort of thinking about the field for a long time, and looking around and sort of noticing some of the different uh, directions that the field was starting to take. So um, as, as I know you know, uh, Asian Canadian studies has, uh, you know, there has been a long kind of preoccupation in sort of thinking about the nation state, right, in sort of thinking and critiquing um, institutionalized practices of racism, you know, sort of things like that. Um, you know, and, and sort of this uh, earlier wave of Asian Canadian studies had done a lot of really important work to open up that space, right? And to really give us a language to offer that kind of critique. So, you know, you can think about earlier work that was really interested, say, in thinking about Japanese Canadian internment, uh, Chinese Canadian head tax out on the West Coast. There was a lot of discussion about the Komagatamaru um, you know, and, and sort of thinking about how, uh, you know, sort of the bodies of, of Asian Canadians had been sort of restricted, uh, sort of monitored, uh, you know, and the ways that it had been subjected to state forms of discrimination, right? So we can think about, you know, the labor of a lot of historians, literary scholars, social scientists, cultural studies scholars, right? So folks like Roy Mickey, Don Galnett, Samara Camborelli, Henry Yu, Kristen McAllister, a lot of artists, like you mentioned, Jin Mi Yoon at the beginning, um, Roy Kiyuka, you know, a lot of political activists and writers, a lot of them feminists, and a lot of folks in Asian Canadian studies were obviously all of these things at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of this work had really uh, done the important, uh, laid the important foundation of thinking about racial injustice, and thinking about how that's long been tied to government and citizenship and processes of migration. You know, and, and there has been a, long, a lot of discussion also on questions of identity, right? How do we make space within the Canadian landscape for an Asian Canadian identity? How do we understand problems of race in history and culture, right? So that was kind of the foundation that the field was coming out of. So in this article, um, Chris and I were interested in thinking about, you know, what kinds of changes were we seeing built upon this foundation, right? What were the other directions that were being taken and what were some of the other directions that Asian Canadian studies might start to take, right? So I think when we look at a lot of the earlier work, there'd been so much time thinking about what did it mean to be Asian in Canada, right? And that was and, and still continues to be a really important question. But one of the things that we realized is what had been taken up less was, you know, what did Asian mean in this context, right? So that was a kind of formation and a formulation uh, that wasn't being paid attention to much because often the attention was so much on Canada, right? So Canada as a nation state, as a national identity, as a site of exclusion, as a kind of desired belonging, you know, and, and many other things, right? So in a lot of ways, in a lot of earlier Asian Canadian work, the nation state or Canada had always been the horizon that we looked towards. Uh, for social justice and, and many other things, right? So we were thinking, if we didn't think about Asian Canadian studies only in nation-centered terms, right? What else was possible if we weren't always thinking about the nation as the primary or the only unit? And if we also thought about Asia, not just as a kind of an imagined site or a place that diasporic Asians were somehow distantly connected to, but if we historicized it and thought about it in contemporary specific terms, what else was possible, right? And, you know, and, and so when I think about Diana's work that she's just presented, 
and becomes a really good way of thinking about uh, sort of illustrating the new directions, right? So thinking about uh, Korea as a kind of place with active histories and a place that's really shaping um, memory and identity and a sense of self so that uh, what we mean by Asian Canadian is more than just how, say, something like state-sanctioned multiculturalism flattens it out. Um, so we were sort of thinking about that. We were also think interested in thinking about Asian racialization as a form of racialization that is distinct, right? That occurs alongside of other forms of racialization, but has its own kinds of logics, its own narratives, its own stereotypes, right? So when we were thinking about all of these things, we were thinking, you know, the directions that the field was taking, there were like two that I would like to highlight. One was thinking trans-specifically. For, so for those of us on the West Coast, that gave us the opportunity of thinking of ourselves in relation to the Pacific or as part of the Trans-Pacific. So looking that direction instead of eastwards and as part of the nation, and also thinking about the kinds of histories and migrations, imperialisms, militarisms, flows of capital, and so on, right? So for example, if we think about British colonialism, here we typically think about that in relation to Canadian history. But thinking about British colonialism also gives us a way of thinking about the relations with other places like Australia, Singapore, Hong Kong, as there are these shared histories also of colonialism. Um, so that was sort of one strand that we were interested in. Another direction that we were kind of thinking about was how do we also think about other um, forms of relationality that move us away from the state? So Asian Indigenous relations, for example, or Asian and Black relations. So um, it's a way of thinking about what a literary scholar, Joanne Liao, called, like thinks about in terms of joining. So how do we think about the interdependencies or intimacies or linkages between spaces? Um, and so, uh, you know, someone like uh, Jin Mee's work is a really great example of this because it, it helps us think about all, kind of all of these concerns, right? So how can we look at trans-Pacific migrations and movements and militarisms through a project like, through this one, uh, Longview? So in Longview, we're looking across the Pacific. We're connected in terms of both the land here because uh, we're conscious that we're looking from the traditional territories of the New Chalmut First Nations. And we're also conscious um, that we're looking at land on the other side of the Pacific. And we're also conscious of the water that separates and connects this land. So it, uh, you know, so those were some of the kinds of new directions that we were kind of noting that were really exciting. There's a photograph of a series of long view and then the video of long view. So yeah, and then she, would you like me to explain this for, well, let, let's put it in, in, during the Q&A just in case. Sure, and yeah. It, it, all your time. So, yeah, no. Yes, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, if you wanted to speak a little bit about it, I know you know this work quite well. Mm, so this one by Jimmy Yoon, she um like takes photos and videos of the scene in the uh, Musqueam uh uh like uh, uh land and then the, they're their fa her family members digging the ground and then Jim, uh, a figure in a black suit it's Jimmy but apparently but we, we don't know if that's Jimmy but she jumps into the hole and then the camera all of a sudden like brings like ziggy ziggy like mosaic and then it travels back to Korea and then it kind of brings this um, the parallel history of militarization, colonization, and then the use of the land, colonized land for development, capitalism. They kind of all link to each other. So this actually this was my question to you, but I'll just say <laughs> interreferencing that you mentioned in your article, like seeing Canada's indigenous uh, colonization uh, st struggle and then Korea's history like in a kind of parallel. I think this is a very good example of that approach. So um, awareing the time constraint, let me jump to the next question. And um, could you explain um, how some literature related to um, uh, uh, your terms, you probably very important terms for 
Um, nowadays, Canadian, uh, Asian Canadian diaspora studies, for example, settler of color, immigrant complicity, and Asian complicity. Could you please elaborate these terms maybe with some examples of the literature you mentioned in the article? Yeah, um, I mean, the, uh, the idea in interreferencing was to kind of shift what we take as our points of reference, right? So again, like, if we're moving away from always taking the nation state as our as our as our point of reference or the audience that we're talking to, right? You know, then I think it becomes really interesting if we say, well, what if we make someone else our audience or you know, other our sort of there are other points of connection that we want to draw upon. And how what does that let us see differently? So then say to turn to um indigenous histories, indigenous experiences and stories and to use those as our points of reference. It draws into relief, uh, you know, ways of understanding colonization, imperialism, very sort of specific um, sort of moments in history as well, and how we experience these legacies. So, um, you know, I think it also becomes important because uh, there has been a lot of attention more recently in terms of thinking about how do we understand ourselves um, as Asian uh, peoples living in Canada? And how do we understand our relations to uh, Indigenous lands and Indigenous peoples? How do we sort of, a lot of scholars have done, um, a lot of scholars like Rita Wong, Larissa Lai, uh, Gage Diabo, uh, Melissa Fung, uh, you know, they're, for example, trying to think through these relations. You know, what does that mean ethically? you know, sort of politically, how do we turn to the literature? Um, I think, and there have been discussions about what kinds of settlers um, can we understand Asians to be, right? So there are terms like settlers of color, uh, questions of complicity, uh, you know, is it immigrant complicity, Asian complicity? Um, and I think um, in a kind of structural sense within the structures of settler colonialism, um, you know, for sure, there is this, this problem of complicity. Just by virtue of being here, there is the act of displacement that is happening. And complicity is, of course, it's a legal term, right? It uh, is one that you use when you're thinking about um, helping to commit a crime or a wrongdoing. Um, and this is an important dimension because Indigenous dispossession is about land theft. It's a matter that's been brought before the courts repeatedly. It's a matter of law and justice. Right, social as well as economic law. But, you know, and I think that for sure is a really important part of the conversation. Another part of the conversation um, that we're thinking through is immigrant or Asian complicity is also complicated because of the different strands that are involved. So structurally, for sure, it's a matter of dispossession. At the same time, Settlers of color, it's a term that signals a different relation to settler colonialism. It's different from European settler uh, colonialism. So unlike European settlers, uh, whose presence we can trace back to the arrival of European colonialism with expeditions and soldiers, traders, missionary settlers. Um, when we think about Asian and black migrants, for example, there are a different set of conditions, a different set of restrictions um, that determine that first arrival. So when scholars like Eve Tuck um, and Wayne, Wayne Yang are writing, you know, they make the really important point that European settlers, uh, they come with the intention of making a new home in this land. And I think that's important, right? Like making a home, wanting to settle. But when we think about um, folks that were racialized folks that were brought to North America as slaves, or if they traveled as temporary or indentured labor, um, the intention was often not uh, to stay. Right, and they didn't hadn't many hadn't come willingly, so the occupation on indigenous land didn't come with exactly the same kind of settler sovereignty that Tuck and Yang are talking about. So there aren't there isn't the same kind of freedom, you know. And many scholars have pointed out, you know, there also aren't the same kinds of rights and recognitions that uh, white Canadians expect and typically received. So there are a lot of distinctions that kind of trouble this kind of conflation of migration with colonialism and they draw attention to the design of empire. So when we look at the literature, there's a really, there's a small but really important body of material. So um, Sky Lee's Disappearing Moon Cafe, uh, which is, you know, about 
four generations of a Chinese Canadian family um, and the patriarch uh, Gui Chang's relationship with an indigenous woman. Uh, Kalora, that's a text we often turn to, to sort of think through uh, the implications. Um, Li Miracle's story, Yin Chin is another one. Um, uh, Peter Blow's documentary, Village of Widows, uh, and Marie Clement's um, play. Uh, those are, are things that are really important. Um, Marie Clement's play uh, and Peter Blow's uh, documentary, I think that becomes a really kind of uh, great example of everything that we've been talking about, sort of interreferencing these kinds of relations. You know, they draw our attention to um, the Satu Dene um, and how, you know, they had uh, been used to transport and mine uranium. Uh, and, you know, they hadn't been told about the risks of mining uranium. A lot of people that did that work in the 1940s developed cancer later, um, you know, and, and perished. And that uranium then was also used to produce um, atomic bombs that we know, of course, were dropped on Japan. And so there's a whole sort of set of conversations in histories, a lot of things that kind of become illuminated when we make these the kinds of points um, of interreferencing in different kinds of relations um, to each other and to land that we can start to think through. I especially was fascinated by the, the story of Gui Chang and his lover, Kelora, an indigenous woman who like helped him and like in Sky this disappearing moon cafe. And that uh it's a seemingly uh romance story, but it turned to kind of tragedy. And then um what I felt about that story is that the story reminds uh, because Gui Chang chooses to leave his lover for survival and from the fear of hunger, it reminds us that feeling empathy is easy, but keeping solidarity is not. Keeping solidarity is challenging when we face our own survival is at stake. And I like uh, I like this sentence in your text. I'm quoting, Gui Chang's fortunes prosper as he reaps the benefits from the intertwined machineries of colonialism and capitalism. And this part, I also thought about how Diana's work touched upon the discourse of structural racism, which is deeply grounded in colonialism and capitalism. And this, oh, I'm also relating to my own um, PhD dissertation, which questions about one chapter, questioned about how, sh how our empathy for distant other short last. And what kind of empathy is meaningful and how do we not turn the suffering of others as a spectacle in visual art? And can arts generate transnational or transgenerational empathy and which it in turn may gear to building solidarity? So of course we don't have answer to this question and um, I ask these questions for us to think together and yes, um, th I think this would be a great time uh, for me to thank Christine and Diana for sharing their work with us. And um, just a reminder to submit your thoughts and questions through the Q&A button on screen. I am. Thank you, Christine and Diana. Um, is anyone have any question about uh, the two audience? Oh, is it possible to view these artworks at Rome? Uh, no, we are not having an exhibition of them yet. Who knows in the future, because I'm here. Um, actually, you can go to the artist websites. Diana has a very good artist website. Jimmy Yoon has a wonderful uh, website. Um, I actually pre prepared for some slides to introduce their work. Just one moment. Thank you for the question. So this is the, the exhibition, uh, Reimagining Re Places, Lands to Our Home, uh, at Korean Culture Center in Ottawa early this year in spring. And um, so Jimmy's single channel video, Long View, I'm sorry, Long Time So Long, is uh, um, 
she she um it was made during the pandemic but she always emphasized that this is not about pandemic she uh set the camera on unceded Musqueam land with the troubled history of colonial and environmental destruction and the video shows a masked figure walking into a shifting Asturian landscape creating a sense of disorientation and isolation that is at once political and psychic real and surreal and as well as arcade and futuristic and um it's a video with sound sound is very important here which i cannot show you today sorry and yun jin jong yun jin jong is um she's based in toronto and working between korea and uh toronto her multi multimedia works uh this in particular this exhibition speaks about displacement and her photographic words connect Korean displaced people uh, through forced labor during the Japanese colonial period to those who have lost their homes uh, today. Like it, she's linking to Canada's housing issues during and after pandemic. And the, the installation using a tent and augmented reality invited audience particip participation to reflect on and take action to help the vulnerable people who have lost their housing due to war and disaster, as well as economic inequality. And then we invited audience to bring like uh, donation items, uh, for example, blankets or cash that can be donated to people who are in need. Um, Dinah's work, we already explained. Uh, okay, I think there are questions coming, let me see. Who work in this area. Uh, there's a question whether, um, thank you all for the talk and for introducing these amazing artists. I'm wondering if there are more artists who work in this area. There are, yes, there are um, artists such as Jenny Yu who has been working on migration. And um, there is a recent, recent there is an artist who's an OCAD graduate who's having a show at John uh, B. Aired Gallery, Maria Mihan Kim who's talking about like Korean diaspora and the feeling of Han, like kind of resentfulness. Uh, as for Miss, oh, there's another question. As for Miss Yu, what prompted the switch from photography to participatory work? Diana? Oh, sure. Um, well, I, I still work in photography. Um, but I wanted to do a participatory work for the uh, van attack and for the across boundaries work, because I think it's really important as an artist to try to activate space and activate thought and have participants in an experiential uh, manner. So I think um, uh, with the ribbons, there's just a symbolic gesture in Korea. There was... Um, a lot of ribbons put on uh, the fences where the DMZ was. So um, I just found it, it was, the ribbon and participatory work to be part of kind of a, a memorialization. And, um, but I still work in photography primarily. Thank you. There's a question. Are there any exhibit on at the ROM that connects to this talk or is the purpose of the talk to share ideas and research? Um, I'm not going. I'm not used to going to a program that is independent of an exhibition, but I love it. Okay, so this is actually a um a program initiated because I had an exhibition at Korea Culture Center, and the Korea Culture Center and the ROM has a very good relationship. And I'm a ROM curator, and yes, and this is also kind of um um the reason why we're having this is. We never had a Korean diaspora talk at Rome. So this is the very first one. This is also kind of my manifesto as a Korean Canadian art history and curator who, who joined Rome and uh, and who work on contemporary art. So I hope this is a good opportunity for everyone. And we Rome encourages any activities related to diversity, inclusiveness, and like reach to a broader audience. Thank you for the question. Another question to Diana. What do you think the difference is between your experience as a second generation immigrant of seeing the DMZ versus South Korean citizens? Is there a different nuance to the sense of loss because of the difference? 
Does it bring about questions around what is brought about an ocean's distance from homeland? That's a really good question. Um, ocean's distance from homeland, for sure. It it kind of you know creates this really extreme you know sense of loss because you're so far away. You're so far away from the conflict and the division. And then there's also this um, kind of distance and loss of forget forgetting as well that happens. But I know that um, a lot of South Koreans who did not lose family in the war are a little desensitized. They, they're they just bombarded with um, the DMZ pictures and, and whatnot. So as a South Korean citizen, I think there's, there's a different type of experience. I can't speak for them, but I know that there are people and young, I did some interviews and some young people are like, well, we know that the Korean War was started not just from North Koreans, but from the bigger superpowers who wanted to create the war in Korea. And some students said in these interviews that um, they just stopped caring. They they don't they don't want there to be a reunification. They don't want there to be anything to do with North Korea. But I think my position is romanticized. And I know it is because I I know it would be complicated to have a reunification, but I feel like that would be such a humane thing to do. Um, but it's complicated. And I, I think um, as Koreans, what do we do? You know, what can we do? Right. Like, how do we remember? How do we consider? How do we keep it on our mind in our minds when when there's this forgetting that happens? because of distance. So I, I don't know if Christine has something, she feels that um, she might feel that South Koreans might feel differently about her situation in relationship to the DMZ. Um, thank, thank you, Diana. Um, I really enjoyed seeing your work um, and I really loved uh, the way that you were bringing all of these different things together. So thinking about our kinds of connections um, you know, as as people in the diaspora to uh, to Korea and to sort of reframing those kinds of moments uh, that have been really important ones, um, you know, and, and sort of thinking about how they resonate differently. So, you know, I think, um, you know, I take your point that, you know, that uh, moment of the DMZ holds a certain moment, a uh, set of meanings for us, um, for those of us, you know, that didn't experience that migration directly. You know, and sort of hearing about it mediated through the stories of family members um, and sort of through other mediums, right? So through films and, and sort of literature and, and sort of visual art. Um, and I think it does that really important work of kind of asking us uh, also to think about how different generations um, have experienced that separation, you know, and sort of thinking about how now, you know, the, the separation has gone on for for so long, right? I think it's like 70, 75 years or something now. So I think you know, that also, you know, I, what, what I really appreciate is um, the way that you're asking us to return to this moment uh, that sort of read as a kind of big major marker, but also asking us to think about it with nuance, thinking about our positionalities and thinking about the different kinds of stories that have come out of that. So I think it's really important that you are then, you know, asking us to think about who the story is told for, how it's you know, and being kind of mindful of the kind of complicated political and social agendas, um, you know, that kind of continue to maintain that division. Um, so I think, you know, that that's all really, uh, yeah, really important. There, uh, let me take one last question. Uh, there's a question to Dr. Kim. The term interreferencing is interesting. How is it that different from intercultural or interracial? Um, I think, you know, interreferencing is really about thinking about very specific issues, right, or points of referencing. Um, so, and really sort of thinking about the kinds of histories and cultures uh, that are involved. So um, interreferencing comes from Taiwanese uh, cultural studies scholar, Quan Sing Cheng, as, as you know, um, you know, and, you know, it was really, I think, uh, Quan, when Quan Sing was using it, was really thinking about how do we talk about between different parts of Asia, for example. 
And how do we kind of, instead of always thinking about Asia and the West, you know, kind of shift the terms of that dialogue, right? So how do we think about the points of commonality? How can we think about these different histories? So for example, it looks different, um, say in your work to think about, you know, uh, Korea and Guyana, right? There are different ways then of understanding colonization, you know, or sort of global history and different ways of understanding um, non-aligned movements and nations, right? And that's not something that we typically see if we just sort of think uh, Asia versus the West, right? In these big binaries. Um, so it's kind of uh, that sort of approach. Um, it So it has a lot of resonances like with intercultural or interracial. It is just, um, you know, that's kind of the history or the genealogy that it comes out of. So yeah, like how would it look differently, say, to think about, um, you know, Seoul and Phnom Penh or, or even, you know, like Diana's work to think about North and South Korea in relation to each other, right? Like if we make those the points of reference for each other, what can we see that we typically don't look at that carefully? So one comment that I, um, I think I should mention uh, from the audience, are Asians behind other immigrant cultures in reconciling and publicly acknowledging the effects of colonialism? Actually, uh, we are more, uh, compared to other communities, I don't know, but Canada in general, Korea has a long history of colonization like from the pre-modern time, but also during the Japanese colonial period from 1910 to 1945. The colonial studies and colonial discourse is a lot, it has started from 1945 and it's very strong. So nowadays we have like people in the referencing Korea's comfort women uh, studies with uh, indigenous, uh, missing and murdered indigenous women and artists working on these topics. We also had a recently um, an exhibition in uh, Toronto by Korean Artists Society of Canada who put together exhibitions, Korean Canadian artists also Canadian Indigenous artists too. So there are many efforts to see them together and then like um, be part of the uh, discourse. So we, uh, I have to wrap up. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you for joining this talk. We're, uh, we're living in a uh, time with many terrible situations taking place in other parts of the world. And we are here talking about art and literature. We create art, make exhibitions, write on literature. The artist makes invisible visible. Writers write unheard to be heard, unwritten to be written. In it, we work on how to practice empathy and generate solidarity. I think this is the power of art and literature. I hope this talk was meaningful to all of you, and I hope you have a thoughtful afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.